Cool. So welcome back. Uh, we'll have the second talk tonight by Simon Brand, who works at Codeplay Software, and we'll talk to you about how Rust gets polymorphism right. So I'll just leave it to him and introduce himself. But also, thanks, Simon. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's meeting of Programmers Anonymous. I'm very, very pleased to be here. My name is Simon, and I'm a C++ programmer. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> so I am um, what you might call a beginner in Rust. Um, I'm a C++ expert. Um, I spend most of my time writing C++, writing compilers, um, debuggers, profilers, doing standards work, um, all this kind of stuff. Um, but my Rust is not fantastic, so if I do anything non-idiomatic or anything that looks weird, it's not because I'm being smart, it's because I'm being wrong. <laughs> so please tell me if you see something which you do not agree with, because it's probably just me being silly. Your Rust is selected. <laughs> so my talk today is on how Rust gets polymorphism right. So I'm going to be mostly comparing to C++, because that's what I know, and that's kind of what a lot of Rust's... Um, kind of user base know as well. People come to Rust from C++ a lot of times. Um, so just to get a feel for the room, um, can you put your hand up if you do not know C++? One hand. So pretty much everyone knows C++. That's good. That's what I was hoping for. Define no. <laughs> <laughs> so if you um, aren't too comfortable with some of the concepts, just um, ask me a question, feel free to stop me at any point and I'll feel, um, be able to answer any of your questions. Um, I work at Codeplay, um, which is based here. I work on compiler backends at the moment. Um, we do heterogeneous um, systems tools um, for things like GPUs and DSPs, that kind of thing. So my agenda for today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of different types of polymorphism, the kind of stuff which you learn in any of computer science 101 course, and then I'm going to do a kind of blow-by-blow -blow comparison of C++ and Rust's approaches to polymorphism. So polymorphism, my um, short definition is it allows constructs to either act differently based on the types which are used, or to treat some, kind, some set of types with the same interface. So I'm mostly going to make differentiation between static polymorphism, which operates at compile time, and dynamic polymorphism, which operates at runtime. So some of the um, examples of static polymorphism, function overloading is a very simple one. In C++, you can uh, use the same name for functions which take different types. They can even return different types. They can do completely different things. You could have a function called print, which actually um, just adds together a couple of numbers and returns them. I hope whatever you'd be wrong, but you know that's a different thing. Um, we have templates in C++, which are C++'s kind of major static polymorphism for generic interfaces. Um, a lot of languages have generics, unless you're Go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, and then traits, which are um, a feature of Rust, which I'm sure a lot of you know about. I'll be going into more detail about some of these um, concepts later on. Dynamic polymorphism, again, at runtime. Some um, possible examples of this are virtual functions, where you have some kind of inheritance hierarchy, and you can do dynamic dispatch based on um, the type of something at runtime rather than the type at compile time. We have things like the visitor pattern, which is often used to kind of add um, functionality to classes from outside of the definition. And this is going to be um, quite relevant later on. We have variants, which can either be um, a library feature or they can be a language feature. And then we have things like checked casting. Um, in C++ we have dynamic cast, which allows you to check cast of the dynamic type of an object using some runtime type information. So that's my lightning tour of polymorphism, and now I'm going to compare um, C++ and Rust's approaches to some of these concepts. So here's a little table which I made up. You might notice that C++ has a lot of different concepts which roughly more or less map onto Rust's traits. These are either 
um, traits or trait objects, which are kind of the, the dynamic version of traits. And then down at the bottom here, we have variant, which maps onto Rust um, enums, which are very, very um, powerful if you're just familiar with the C++ version of enums. And I'm going to be going into more detail about all of these. So, a bold statement. Inheritance for dynamic polymorphism is too intrusive. I would also argue that it's generally terrible, but I don't want to make too many enemies, so I'm just going to stick with this for now. Um, what I mean by this is, say I have this code. I have some interface abstract class, whatever you want to call it, called printable. Something satisfies this if it has a um, function called print, which takes no arguments and returns nothing. So this is just going to be like dumping out my class to still see out or whatever. I then have a couple of classes which inherit from this. You can see here foo is inheriting from printable, and so is bar, and they can override this print function. So now, at runtime, I could have some pointer to a printable, and maybe it's a foo, maybe it's a bar. I can call pr print, and it will do the right thing. It will do dy uh, dynamic dispatch. So this is dynamic polymorphism. But there's a problem, and that problem comes in this aptly named oh no class. So oh no has the same interface. It has a function called print, which takes no arguments, returns nothing. Um, but there's a bit of a problem. Can anyone tell me what the problem is? It's not readable. The, the comment was it's not printable. And yes, that's the, the problem. It does not inherit from our printable interface abstract class. So if I want to do something like this, have a, a vector of um, printable objects, then I can very happily um, dynamically allocate a foo object and a bar object and push them into this vector. This will work. It's fine. It will do dynamic dispatch. But if I try and do this with an oh no, then the compiler shouts at me. It gets very, very mad because oh no does not inherit from printable. Now, oh no, I have noted here, is some library class. I cannot just go in and change the definition of this class. If I could, this would all be fine, because I could just make it inherit from printable and everyone's happy. But there's many, many cases in which you can't do this. Maybe you don't own this code. Maybe you don't have the, all the source. You only have the headers. Um, this is a very, very common occurrence. Maybe you just don't want to break third library code. So this is not a very maintainable or flexible situation to be in. So inheritance for dynamic polymorphism is too intrusive. On the other hand, trait objects are unobtrusive. So in Rust, I can say something like this. I can say something is printable if it has a function called print, which takes a reference to self this is the same kind of thing as the, um, as the virtual function we saw in the C++ example. Um, takes a reference to self and returns nothing. And then I can have a few classes, such as or structs, foo, bar, and yay. But notice that I haven't defined um, the print function for foo and bar yet, nor for yay. I'm going to do it separately here. So I say I'm going to implement printable for these types, for foo, for bar, for ye. And I can make these do whatever I want. These implementations can differ as much as I need them to. So can anyone tell me what the difference is between these definitions for either code which I own or code which is in a library which I don't own? Yes, Peter? It's about the orphan rule. Pardon? It's about the orphan in input rule. The orphan rule, and I'm not familiar to, with it. You have to implement the traits in the same module as either the trait is defined or the type you're implementing your code is defined. Okay, so the, the comment was um, that it was to do with how I would have to implement these in um, certain modules. What I'm really looking for is these definitions are very much the same. I don't have to um, implement these definitions in a different way depending on whether I own the code or whether it's a library. 
I don't have to put the implementation of these functions in the definition of my types, whereas in C++ I did. So I can very, very easily take some yay type from a library which maybe has some predefined behavior for dumping out a, a stream, and I can adapt it for my own needs. And then when I go on to make a vector of these things, then I can happily push in a yay, a bar, and a foo, and I can print them out, and it's all the same interface. It all just works. This is very, very powerful, because whereas in C++, I have a very obtrusive method of dynamic polymorphism, this one is a lot less obtrusive, and it lets me um, very, very flexibly add behavior onto types which I don't own. So inheritance for dynamic polymorphism is too intrusive, and trait objects are unobtrusive. Does anyone disagree with these or have any questions about this part of the talk? Nope. Sorry. I'm not familiar with C as I said, but trait object is more like dependency injection? Um, so trait objects are... Um, what you are doing very, so not very the other slide here, so the printable in the back box printable is like more of like saying dependency injection, you, you want to think of this type? So this um, back box printable box is kind of Rust dynamic allocation. Um, type. So this is saying that um, I'm going to be storing um, printable objects somewhere and anything which implements the printable trait is going to be storable. So I don't have to care about um, like allocating these myself. I'm going to let the implementation deal with all of that. I just care that printable is implemented for these types. Like a contract. Yes, it's kind of like a contract which is enforced at compile time. Yes. Yes. I've heard people say that traits aren't intrusive enough in that it can be sometimes difficult to express is a relationships between types. Okay, so the comment was um, heard that traits are sometimes not intrusive enough as uh, wait, sorry, what was the last bit of the comment? Yes, sometimes hard to express is a relationship between types. Right, so it's hard to express is a relationship between types. Uh, I'm afraid I'm not um, familiar enough with all of the, the different concepts of play to comment on that, but if anyone else has any comments on that, I'd be glad to hear them. So, okay, moving on. The visitor pattern is a hack. Lots of nods from the audience. I'm in the right place. So if you're not familiar with the visitor pattern, I have something like this. I can have an animal type, and a dog is an animal, a cat is an animal, obviously. So now I want to add some kind of way of, um, of adding functionality onto these types without needing to um, intrusively change the definition of my classes. So just as we saw trait objects a few, a few minutes ago, um, we want to do something kind of similar. And one way of doing this is the visitor patterns, one of the kind of classic design patterns which you may see in C++ or Java or any number of these um, languages which kind of allow an object-oriented style. So I do something like this. I say, my animal accepts some visitor, and dog accepts some visitor, and cat accepts some visitor. And then a visitor is something which can operate on dogs and cats. And then the dog and cat methods um, forward on themselves to these visit functions. So the way this works is because um, this in this function is a type dog star. And in this one it's a cat star. We get a method by which we kind of know what types we're dealing with. And we can have this interface which is dealing directly with dogs and cats rather than just animals. So then if we want to have a visitor which prints out these things, so I just want to print out dog if it's a dog, cat if it's a cat, then I create a print visitor and I override these functions and I can do whatever I want. So then I can do something like have a pointer to an animal, make a print visitor, 
and then say animal accept my visitor and it will run through all of this awful awful boilerplate and give me what I want. So if you've used any languages which support things like multiple dispatch, like um, a lot of Lisp dialects, things like this, they support this in the language. You don't have to make awful um, inheritance-based hacks around it. So the visitor pattern is a hack. Library-based variants are verbose and hard for, be for beginners. So C++17 introduces this std variant type. Mostly very good, I like it a lot, and I use it in my own code. Um, so instead of all of that inheritance, malarkey, and virtual functions, and overriding, we can just say, okay, we have a dog and a cat, and an animal is one of a dog or a cat. I can then create an animal, set it to something, and then I want to do something which will print out cat or dog, just like we did in, in here. So one way in which I could do that is I could create a type called printer, which just overrides these um, the, the call operator for dogs and cats, and then I just use it here. This is quite an improvement on our visitor pattern, but it's still not great. Like We don't want to be creating types just in order to specify this kind of behavior. We want to do it in place, like while we're writing the function. Uh, it's also quite a lot of syntactic overhead, like we're having to say operator, call, and override things, and it's not, it's not great. Um, one possible solution to this, which has come up and uh, has got a standards proposal for it, and a lot of people use, is this um, overloaded concept. So what this does is takes a, a bunch of lambdas and composes them into some object which does the same kind of thing as this. So instead of overriding a bunch of call operators, we just pass a bunch of lambdas. So um, this is C++? This is C++, yes. Okay, my C++ is 20-something years ago. <laughs> I was used to um, quite nasty stuff, pre-standard library, pre-boost. So all that kind of stuff is quite funky. I know about lambdas and Java, but how exactly do, do lambdas and C++ work? So lambdas and C++... Um, go back to a bit of code and sort of hover over it and oh, explain to me what's lambda fine. Okay. So, okay, yeah. so lambdas in C++ are essentially they create an object oh, which no overloads the call operator and um, uses... The typing information is not required, it's implied. Pardon? The typing information is implied. Um, the return type is deduced, the parameter types yeah. are um, specified by the okay. programmer here. Got it. That's it. Thank you. Um, so you can use this kind of overloaded thing. Um, the problem with this is visit to this visitor type. Um, sorry, this variant type is supposed to be something which is accessible, something which is a vocabulary type, which we can say, if I want to have something which is this or this or this, this is the kind of concept I want to be reaching for. But Suddenly, I have to teach beginners about lambdas and all the syntax. I, I forgot a comma, so it's not going to compile. It's probably going to give me an awful error, which no beginner is going to understand. Uh, and then this overloaded thing so said it's not standardized yet, so you have to copy something off the internet. In C17, it will look something like this. So suddenly, I'm a beginner. I need to understand. Um, variadic templates, uh, pack expansion for multiple inheritance, uh, pack expansion in using declarations, and variadic template class deduction guides. <laughs> like, beginners shouldn't be anywhere near this code. Like, they shouldn't even know it exists. <laughs> uh, so, and, and this is the C17 version. The C14 one is like, it will make you cry. So, this is bad. So library-based variants are verbose and hard for beginners. Language-based variants are clear and user-friendly. So whereas in C++ we have a library type for expressing a variant, in Rust we have a language construct for expressing variants. And this is called enum. So I can have an animal, and it can be a cat or a dog. And then I have some variable of type animal, and I have this nice pattern matching syntax. So if you're familiar with 
um, functional programming languages, this is trying to do kind of the same thing. So here we just say we match against A, and if it's a cat, then we print cat, and if it's dog, we print dog. We don't have to deal with all of the crazy stuff we had to in C++. And what's more, these um, enumerator variants, they don't have to be just simple tags. They can be whatever we want. We can store a string in them. They can have named fields, like <coughs> a struct. And then we can pattern match on them. So we can say, if I've got a page load, then print that. If I've got a paste, well, that has a string. So I can get access to the string. Um, if it's a struct, I can destructure it. I can get all the information I want by pattern matching. I'm sure you'll know, even if you do not know Rust, if you look at this code, you can get a fairly reasonable idea of what it's doing. If you look at this, and you don't know what, like, you've got no chance. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so, language-based variants are clear and user-friendly. Does anyone disagree with or have comments about this bit? One thing to note, I guess, is that the, because they're type-based in C++ as well, you, you can't have like two variants that are both a string. Can't have two variants which are both a string. Do you mean for? So you can't have like a, a name that's a string or like a a last name or something if you have in a, in one variant. You can't just have like two different strings and then. Oh right, yeah. Or... So the the comment is you um, the types in a variant are um, the identity. they don't have the same kind of identity semantics that you do here. So whereas in in Rust, you could you could have a paste which yeah. has a string, and you could have uh, I don't know a cut which has a string, and you could have whatever else which has a string. But in C plus plus, you couldn't just say um, std variant std string std string std string. It doesn't make sense. You would have to have some kind of like strong type so, def yeah. thing. Yeah. Okay. Next templates. C++ templates for simple static polymorphism work. They're, they're fine. So you're hopefully all familiar with um, std vector, it's like the kind of workhorse um, container type for C++. So it's um, templated on some type T, which is stores. It has an allocator as well, but don't worry. Um, so I can happily have a function which returns a std vector parameterized by some type T. I can have a function which takes a std vector, and I can call them like so. So I specify I want to make a vector of ints, and it will do it. And then I can say take a vector, and it will deduce the types for me. So this is all, this is all fine. It, it, it works pretty well. It does what you would expect most of the time, as long as you're not overloading on certain things. Um, but it's mostly OK. So templates for simple static polymorphism work. And then traits for simple static polymorphism also kind of work in very much the same way. So we can have a vector um, parameterized by some t, and then we can make a vector of t's, and we can take a vector of t's. And it all looks uh, minus some syntactical differences. It's pretty much the same, what you would expect. So these both work. Constrained templates will make you cry blood. So back to our printable example, if we have two types which um, can be printed, and then we have some kind of function which requires that whatever you pass to it is printable. No, these are not um, joined by any inheritance hierarchy or anything like that. They're just types, and we just say, I don't care what type you are, as long as you um, implement this interface, then it's fine by me. So one way we can express this in C++ is a static assert. So we can sit, assert that for whatever t we're using, t is printable. And if it's not, we'll get a reasonably clear um, error message saying, well, t must be printable, you did something wrong. And it'll tell you where you did something wrong. One major problem with this is the um, constraint on the type is not in the declaration of the function. So what I mean is, I look at do then print, it takes a t, it returns a void. I don't know anything about what this function requires of the types I'm passing in here. I have to look at the definition in order to know that. So that's a problem. It's not 
um, documented. I could write documentation for it, but surely we all know the problems that are inherent in that. So one possibility is we can use enable if. Yay! Hands up if you think this is clear, understandable code. No hands. Yeah. So this is something in C++ which is essentially a major hack which allows us to conditionally disable function overloads. Uh, I could tell you how it works and how to implement it, but I'm not going to. Suffice to say, this does a thing, and you never know what to know about it if you don't need to. Another major problem is I haven't shown you the definition for his printable yet. I'm going to. <laughs> this is one possibility in C17. And yeah, unless you're a metaprogramming expert, then you have no idea what this does. Like, we've got defaulted template parameters y, we've got std void t, what's that? <laughs> decal type, std decal val t, like, no, this is bad. This is almost even worse than that overload thing that I showed you earlier. And again, this is C17, the C11 14 versions of this. Uh, you could write the same kind of stuff, but you'd have to write more boilerplate in there. You don't want to do this. This is bad. This is bad. Constraint tables will make you cry. Traits will make you smile quite wildly. So, we have a trait printable. You can say it has a function which takes a self reference, returns nothing. Then I can just say, I'm doing then print, I take a printable, I'm going to print it. That's it. This is almost entirely equivalent to all of this nonsense. <laughs> and again, even if you do not know Rust, you can look at this and you can kind of tell what it's doing. Maybe you need to look at it a bit to work out what this T colon printable is, but it's just syntax. It's understandable. Yeah, this is understandable. Constrained templates will make you cry, and traits will make you smile. Does anyone disagree with or have any comments on this? Yes? Uh, do you not cheat with the C++ version? Because you, surely you could have had a, uh, a base class in that case when you can constrain the... Uh, so the, the question is, surely in the C++ version you could have an um, inheritance hierarchy, but the entire point is you don't want an inheritance hierarchy. So... Um, for example, this could be this could be anything. This could be is um, incrementable. You can't have an, in an inheritance hierarchy from then because then you won't work on um, primitive types. You just want to take anything, and as long as it conforms to some interface, then it will work. Yes. But what about concept? <laughs> I knew someone was going to answer that. Okay. So um, C plus plus has been trying to standardize um, a concept ha called Concepts um, for a decade, um, which do kind of a, a, a very similar thing to this. Um, not quite as powerful, they don't have the, the trait objects which we saw earlier, but um, they've been merged into C20 for now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I yeah, thanks. <laughs> so they've been merged into C20 for now. Um, there has been a paper which said they're bad and they shouldn't be in, and there's a paper which says they're good and they should be in. We'll see what happens. So with the addition of concepts, have they rewritten the standard library, or do you still have to use everything that's in standard library? That's good question. So the um, question was, with C++ concepts, and they're rewriting the standard library. The answer is pretty much yes. They've, got, um, they've um, reserved the STD2 namespace, and um, so the ranges technical specification is the main um, paper which is outlining kind of how concepts should look like in, um, in the future version of the standard. There's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, we're still hit, like, so you know Rust's um, iterator concept, which is quite different from C++'s. The C++ are trying to kind of steal that and and use it, uh, and that's part of the the ranges work. Um, 
so there, there's very much like if if the standard library doesn't work with concepts, then there is like dead on arrival. So there's a lot of work going to make sure that it all works. There is another alternative actually. You cannot you can not add any of that and just let it error error out on the missing methods. What's that? You can just let it error out on the missing method and no add any static checking. <laughs> yes, you could do that. <laughs> Okay, Rust gets polymorphism right, and other languages should learn from it. That's my talk. Thank you. Does anyone have any last questions? Uh, just a question. Would you think polymorphism the like traits, which is what I took the major thing of picking up? Uh, say, for example, in Scala, which is pretty nasty. Uh, would you think? Uh, Polymorphism might be better in another language or in other other languages that would have a good form of polymorphism. I agree. I mean, when I was doing C plus plus, it was fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> virtual, public virtual inherits something or other, <laughs> multiple inheritance diamonds, mixins, and all kinds of shit. <laughs> really pointers and fucking crap. <laughs> And then sort of that morphed into Java and sort of stuck there ever since. And that's sort of gradually getting a bit better. Um, but I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I could see that the traits there are much less kind of uh, hard linked into the, 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 the definition of the trait. You can yep. easily add things in from, from, from the other library, which I thought, now that would just be so much easier. And languages like Scala, functional programming, Give you this notion that you can pass a parameter as a closure and build up state in that closure and call it recursively. Yep. Um, and then you, you, it then becomes easier to evolve. You can get it so far, and if it has to change, you're largely just changing the, the content of, of the closure parameter. Uh, and I'm interested. Particularly with the example of Scala, because Scala tries to be very object oriented with uh, traits, so they get quite hairy and you have to be rather careful about which features of Scala you switch on, because otherwise weird things start to happen. Which is fine by yourself, because there's people in the team and you suddenly switch something on and everybody checks your code out and yep. gets the same weird behaviour, you're fine. Uh, so, so the question is how, as to how, how this trait seems to be maybe the, the, the route to go to get better polymorphism. Yeah, so it's such that the, 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 the hierarchy of polymorphism navigates better through changes. Yeah, so I think the Rust's approach to polymorphism and um, especially its generic programming um, functionality like traits and trait objects. Yeah. Um, will be very, very influential for other programming languages. I mean, we, we look at C++ and it's trying to accept a lot of the, the kind of um, changes which Rust has been making. It's moving away from um, exception-based error handling. It's trying to get a more functional programming um, oriented style. Um, and a lot of this is looking at Rust and seeing how um, it's taken those um, that inherit imperative kind of programming paradigm and adapted it for um, safety and for um, usability and for um, expressibility and I think a lot of languages um, I don't know very much about Scala at all but um, I think languages which are older than Rust will be taking um, its example and languages which are newer than Rust will be building on it. Scala has traits. Yes, it has, Scala has traits. But I don't know how equivalent the Scala tree is, is to the yeah. Rust tree. Cool. Were there other, other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, do you have any insights, especially on the uh, class traits? How are they implemented? Does that mean every class has to have a virtual table pointer, since every class could, in theory, be extended? Um, so the question was, do I know how the traits are implemented? Um, someone can feel free to correct me on this because I don't know very much about the details. So the traits themselves are just a compile time feature. It's the trait objects yeah. implement a, um, essentially a um, virtual dispatch table inside the trait object itself. So it's not stored as part of the um, object which you're essentially type erasing. It's stored as part of the type eraser object itself. So 
it um, kind of separates those concepts. Whereas with C++, as soon as you have inheritance and virtual functions and you're dynamically allocating things, then suddenly you have a virtual dispatch table, even if you didn't want one. Like unless the compiler can de-virtualize everything, um, which they're getting better at. But yes, so it's stored as part of the implementation of the trait object rather than as part of the um, of the type itself. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. On the first slide, when you were comparing C++ uh, and Rust, there was a class ONO, and it has a print version. What prevents you from uh, in C++ to actually make a wrapper which you need from the previous uh, printable uh, thing and calling the, the other method? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Did you have a class that was that had an ONO, the ONO class? Oh, right, yeah, yeah, the ONO class, right. You, you, you could have made a wrapper for, for it. Right, yes, yes. Um, similar to the trait. So the, the comment was for the ONO um, type which I had at the start here, um, I could generate a wrapper class around this which does kind of a similar thing. Um, there are very, very many problems with that. Um, one is as soon as we start scaling this up and using other libraries or using lots of components from libraries, I have to implement this for every single one of them. Two, it's very, um, very difficult to maintain all of the same um, kind of value semantics and um, like no accept specifications, constex specifications on all of the um, <coughs> all of the operations which we're we're trying to to use. So as soon as you write wrapper types, you need to completely understand things like perfect forwarding, um, no accept propagation, constex for propagation, and those are really advanced concepts. Unless you understand all of them, you're going to get something wrong, and some use case is not going to work quite as efficiently, or it's going to break completely. Well, there's a lot of extra code to maintain. Imagine if it was a hundred function instead right. of just one. Okay. Yes, and it's a lot of extra code, especially if you're going to do it completely correctly with maintaining everything you can. That's that's a lot of code. Right. Twelve or fifteen methods for you to implement for a value type correctly. It's so like hundreds of lines of code. Uh, wrapper you write or something like that. Yeah, and especially when you take into account things like member function um, reference qualifiers for moving yourself and things like that, then it's just an explosion. Like you don't want to have to deal with that for even one type. Um, macros. <laughs> <laughs> Was this C++ macros or Rust macros? Uh, I guess Rust would be a little better. <laughs> um, so as a so Rust, Rust macro system is um, very very different from C++. C++ C++'s macro system is just like token pasta. I have a token. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to paste it around and you know whatever. Um, Rust macro system is more kind of on the way to Lisp macros. Um, it doesn't go the entire way, it has its own kind of language for doing um, abstract syntax tree um, manipulations so you can match on how your um, code actually is interpreted by the compiler and then you can generate code based on that. So um, Rust macros allow you to generate code based on um, syntactical constructs which is a very powerful um, technique. and. Um, will reduce a lot of boilerplate, which um, C++ tends to do with horrible macros or ridiculous template hackery. Okay, cool. That's um, all the time we have left, so thanks very much for all your questions, and see you later.